Hello everyone. Welcome to my virtual presentation on mathematical mindsets. My name is Mark Hogue and I'm an assistant professor at Slipper Rock University. I work in the Secondary Education and Foundations of Education Department. Prior to coming to Slipper Rock University, I was both a high school math teacher and a high school administrator. First of all, as we begin to think about mindsets, it's important to position um, our curriculum and the learning outcomes of our standards, both at a state and national level, as they reflect increasing cognitive rigor. And as we think about learning on levels that transcend remembering and even understanding, it's important to begin to think about how our students' motivation, self-esteem, and attitude towards failure really intersect with significant learning outcomes that honor all students. In many cases, individuals have a prevailing conception that the ability to learn is very, very much fixed. And that is simply not true. In fact, we found that studies have shown brains are able to grow and change with very within very short periods. Now, I have not traveled to London, but I do certainly understand the complexity of traveling within a major uh, metropolitan area that also is a very, very old city. A study indicated that London cab drivers uh, demonstrate a tremendous level of spatial memorization and as a result of their need to perform their job duties uh, to navigate London, their hippocampuses grew in size in order to accommodate, again, their needs to uh, make this consideration for their job. We also know that uh, patients who have um, had part of their brain hemispheres remo removed, and that certainly does not sound uh, pleasant at all, were able to either partially or fully recover functions of the part of the brain that were removed. So this idea that, um, again, learning from the standpoint of brain function and brain ability is fixed is simply not true. Now, before someone uh, begins to listen to this and say, wow, uh, this guy has literally fallen off the deep end here. I know something called IQ, and my understanding is, is that uh, IQ is, is a fixed measure of someone's intellectual capacity. Please understand that on a very direct level, IQ or intelligence quotient is a relatively fixed measure of an individual's intelligence. Now, understand and, and please recognize that legitimate IQ tests, which we know as educators, very few students are administered a legitimate IQ test. We're not talking about jumping online here and taking a 10 minute test with advertisements and pop-ups coming in uh, to our web browser but rather a legitimate IQ test has a very high level of statistical reliability. And what that means is, is there's consistency between uh, IQ's tests administered at various points in time. In fact, studies have shown that that reliability coefficient uh, measured through Pearson's R is very, very robust. So please understand that that reflects that whatever this IQ test measures from various administrations uh, does show over time to be very consistent uh, between subjects. Now, validity of IQ tests are also accepted by psychometricians, meaning, uh, again, reliability how consistent are the results and validity 
reflecting the appropriateness, how valid a particular assessment, in this case, the IQ test is. Uh, psychometricians, again, recognize that IQ tests are sound. Now, understand, though, that there are various intelligences that have been posited by giants in the field of cognitive science. Uh, we'll name a few here. Uh, Cattell, um, um, talking again about various aspects of fluid intelligence, etc. By Gotsky with his ZPD and Gardner with multiple intelligences here. Again, an IQ test takes a relatively fixed interpretation of what IQ is and also uh, what, what it is not. But understand again that validity is something that is considered to be uh, significant among an intelligence quotient as well. Now, understand, I share this slide to be very clear. Um, I am not positing or suggesting that someone's intelligence moves substantially uh, over the course of their lifetime. In fact, um, science has shown that an individual's intelligence quotient is, again, as reliability would suggest, relatively uh, a relatively fixed notion. However, it's important that as we think about IQ, that we're not suppressing the notion of students being able to take on significant learning tasks, have the ability to develop and grow, and certainly become improved through, um, through their learning and through learning experiences, that we think about that appropriately going into this discussion of mindset. Now, if you were with me in person, I would ask you to discuss the following statements. Let's look at the four. Number one, your intelligence is something very basic about you that you can't change very much. Number two, you can learn new things, but you can't really change how intelligent you are. Number three, no matter how much intelligence you have, you can always change it quite a bit. And number four, you can always substantially change how intelligent you are. Now, when we think about mindsets, we think about really two camps. And um, it's important to mention that Carol Dweck in her writing, um, seminal writing about mindset, champions that approximately 40% of the adult population um, posits a fixed mindset. About 40% uh, demonstrate a growth mindset. And about 20% of that population um, would be somewhere in a gray space or gray region between fixed and growth. But you can see here, reflecting back on these uh, statements, um, that statements one and two reflect a fixed mindset, statements three and four a growth mindset. Now, if we look over these here, your intelligence is something very basic about you that you can't change very much. You can learn new things, but you can't really change how intelligent you are. Now understand, as I shared in the last slide, as a numerical measure, intelligence is something that is very, very straightforward. Okay, intelligence quotient is measured um, through strict psychometric procedures, which are quantitatively derived. However, again, when we think about the ability to learn and develop and to grow, these repressive statements um, suggesting again that you can't change your intelligence and you can't really again um, uh, demonstrate a level of adaptability are very again repressive to this notion of growth and a positive disposition or outlook related to learning. 
Now, when you look at statements three and four, to no surprise, no matter how intelligent you are, you can always change it or you can get better or grow and you can always substantially change how intelligent you are. And on some level, again, we're not talking in strict terms here about IQ. Again, we're not misleading students or buying into something that is not scientific, but very directly as we talk about um, situations such as our London cab drivers here, when in a position uh, to develop and to grow and to meaningfully interact with material, we absolutely have seen um, in, in, in our profession, individuals and classrooms cha change and shape notions of, again, knowledge acquisition and most importantly, learning. Now, as we look to, on some level, describe and situate those with fixed mindsets, um, these are, again, individuals that have a very behavioristic point of view related to the notion that ability and intelligence is inborn and unchangeable. Um, these would be, again, individuals that are looking at, at at intelligence as you either have it or you don't. And again, this perception, this mindset is not very conducive to teaching and learning. Students with a fixed mindset, individuals with a fixed mindset view successes and failures as a reflection of their innate or their core abilities rather than their effort. Fixed mindset people think that smart people learn things, uh, new things rather, very effortlessly. And if I'm talking to any smart folks out in the crowd right now, um, this very directly is something that is frankly just not true. Uh, fixed mindset folks search for ways to explain away their failures. Um, and that would be you know, certainly a, a strategy of deflection. And oftentimes we see these things manifesting in, um, um, again, a lack of preparation, a lack of effort, and, and, and again, um, transitioning and deflecting blame to other things or other individuals. Now, I hope no one falls over if you're listening to this right now and you're not already asleep but that, that can even be reflected to the teacher. Fixed mindset folks are very rarely able to learn from their mistakes. Fixed mindset folks, again, are looking at mistakes as binary pieces of feedback that further solidify their innate abilities as opposed to giving them a position to uh, take and grow and learn from those mistakes as opportunities to bolster experience. Fixed mindset folks also view challenge um, as a terrifying and perfect opportunity to fail. And because of that, fixed mindset folks are not likely to take on challenges. Um, fixed mindset folks are focused on performance rather than learning. And I have to tell you right now um, that this is not something that is limited to um, students in seventh or eighth grade or students in ninth grade or students in third grade. I, I have the opportunity every year and oftentimes multiple times a year um, to teach a statistics class at the graduate level. And I have found that in many cases, when it comes to the end of the term uh, a project, which essentially provides students with a data set and asks them to formulate a question and to um, derive a statistical um, execution plan to answer their question based upon the data, that Many folks in the spirit of, um, again, 
coddling their grade focus on very, very basic questions. So these are things that we may on some level be, be listening into and thinking about and saying, doggone, um, that shoe fits for me a little bit too. You know, coddling that, that great GPA, and I hear this a lot from students in education, you know, I, I, I've maintained a, maintained a perfect 4.0. Um, that's great, but again, what are the learning outcomes and that focus on performance? And again, students that can really on some level be manifest in some parental expectations that provoke fear, discourage, risk taking. But this notion of focusing on performance rather than learning can certainly be detrimental to um, a growth mindset. Speaking of which, growth mindset folks on the opposite end of the spectrum here really view ability as improving with additional effort. Um, and that may not necessarily be a linear process, but this notion that as I work harder, as I get my heart rate up, I'm going to have a greater ability to run further and even run faster. So these are things to think about. Um, growth mindset folks are able to properly take blame or credit for their successes and failures. And um, we as educators are thinking about this right now, and it's very easy to have students' faces pop into our heads. In fact, while I was just talking about this notion of performance rather than, than learning um, from our last slide with fixed mindset, I, I had honestly and truly a student from my teaching experience, which was many years ago in the high school setting, really pop into my pop into my head. So these are these are certainly characteristics that we can attribute to students both on the growth and fixed side. Understand that skill and knowledge only come with practice and study. Search for ways to improve after experiencing failure so that it doesn't happen again. And again, there are adages that go along with these bullet points for sure too. You challenge is an exciting opportunity for growth. And, and you know, as we look at um, our dimensional aspects of life, um, things that we're certainly exposed to in both a career setting, a personal setting, you know, you may see that on some level, folks are fluid somewhat between fixed and growth, depending on the venue. And that's a very interesting paradigm for sure. But then also um, growth mindset folks have goals that focus on learning rather than performance. I want to learn something here. Um, I'm not as, as, as concerned about um, the B or C that I might earn at the end of this journey. I wanna know how much information um, and how much meaning I can derive from being a part of the class or participating in a growth project, whatever it might be, um, we see that to be a tendency of growth mindset folks. So if you're with me right now, I would ask you, what are some examples of fixed or mindset, fixed or growth mindsets that you've seen in your classroom? And um, how did the respective way of thinking, whether we're talking fixed or growth, really impact or affect your students? And I certainly think that we would reflect on this um, and feel free again to pause your video and jot some notes down if you would like. Pr fairly practically here, we see good students on both sides of that continuum of fixed and growth mindset. Um, again, just because someone is fixed mindset, it does not systematically mean that they're a bad student. In fact, they could um, D display the tendencies of a very strong student. But what are some of those manifest behaviors that we see from those fixed and, both fixed and growth mindset students that again impact the trajectory of their learning in the classroom? How do they interact with others? Um, what's their ability again to take risks? to roll their sleeves up and to engage in rich, rich tasks, which again, I hope as we're, we're talking about this, 
that you're able to really reflect back at the types of learning trajectories we're looking to engage students with. And, and on some level, the necessity of fostering more of a growth-minded student so that they're in a position to tackle significant learning tasks. As we know, and um, this could certainly, again, be transposed to many aspects of life, but folks who are fixed-minded will certainly take failure in, in a much less productive fashion and oftentimes quit and give up. And this is not, again, limited to, to learning mathematics. Um, that is certainly, though, looking back on my own career, something that I've noticed very significantly. And in fact, I will share with you that some of the research that I've been very fortunate to be a part of related to mindsets deals with the mindsets of future K-8 to um, elementary school teachers. And actually that work is uh, taking place in a different state, actually in the state of Virginia, where again, teachers are certified K-8. to But those pre-service teachers' ability to stay with um, or to work through challenging mathematical tasks. And we have seen, to no one's surprise, that college students on that pre-service teaching track who are fixed-minded, one of the telltale characteristics that they exhibit is quitting. Um, they just absolutely throw their arms up in the air and say, that's it, I'm done. And on some level, that is very counter to both their success working through a problem or to try to, again, try alternative methods, et cetera. But it also, and here's the scary part, and why that, that line of inquiry for me is so important is because that mindset that they hold themselves about mathematical tasks and learning math and doing real math um, also can be projected very easily uh, onto his or her students. So that is something that is of significant consideration. Um, students, again, with a fixed mindset may feel less intelligent if they have to put learning effort into learning new material. And they're less likely to do so because, again, that effort is, is really the barrier um, to uh, tackling a substantial task or new material. Um, they're also unable to identify the cause of poor performance in their own practice. And, you know, this really goes back to a significant word that we talk and learn about in um, colleges of education, and that is metacognition, thinking about one's thinking to be reflective. And these are things that um, often are challenging or barriers for fixed mindsetted folks. Again, placing blame and even we've seen our last point here, some fixed-minded students who believe, they absolutely believe they're smart, they have an inner compass that suggests that they're intelligent, they have a working knowledge of this, they're just, they're very less likely to engage with material that's challenging because they're afraid um, either of failure or a lack of effort. Um, and and I think that it's important maybe with this slide just to mention that there is a level of currency that goes along with mindset, okay? Um, right now, I very strategically recorded the screen of this PowerPoint presentation, okay? I'm not doing a portrait here. But if I were, you may or may not be able to observe that I objectively um, need to lose maybe 15 or 20 pounds. Um, I have to tell you though, that my mindset related to losing that weight is very directly not due to an inability. In fact, I've done it before, but it really boils down to a lack of effort. And practically speaking, um, we're not in the business unless you're a health or physical education teacher, K-8 
to necessarily dial our sights into helping our students lose weight. But what we are interested in is preserving um, a sense of hard work and thwarting against lack of effort in class. In fact, that's, that's one of the greatest sins that we see are folks who really sell their ability short out of a lack of effort. And it's important to think that our role as teachers positions us to foster um, students' mindsets in a way that contributes to their ability to be more growth oriented. Now, when we think about impacts of students' growth mindset on learning, we see students are more likely to learn from their failures and to put more effort into receiving or after receiving a poor grade. And we have seen that students with growth mindsets have more positive brain activity getting into brain science here when they make mistakes. Okay, that's stimulating for students with a growth mindset. And again, you have that student in your, in your mind who after failing miserably perhaps on even a question or a task or an activity that you've been working on in class dives back in and redirects his, his or her attention to finding the error, um, working through an alternative method, et cetera, that again, really promotes uh, this notion of growth mindset. Growth mindset of folks, of course, we, we see uh, more likely to seek challenges and to really engage their learning with sincere effort. Um, Growth mindset of folks are able to look at poor performances and even things that, again, they didn't, let's say, for example, prepare well for and to be able to um, take feedback through the form of, in this case, an assessment and reflectively attribute um, that performance to purposeful and, and really productive methods and outcomes as opposed to, again, deflecting and pressing the blame button. And again, students with a growth mindset have a greater awareness of errors, making them more likely to want to go back and correct them. You know, it's amazing to me, I will share this with you, and some of you might be in this boat as well, as a former math teacher, and specifically with my Algebra II students, in many cases, not all, but in many, uh, on, on uh, quizzes leading up to a summative assessment, on classroom quizzes, I would provide students with the opportunity for partial credit to go back and to dive into any problems that they missed on their first attempt at the quiz and to um, essentially return to me version number two. Um, and it always was amazing to me, especially early in my career before I had maybe a chance to try to work more in, more on buy-in and, and learning. And I didn't have the language for mindset at that time. It just wasn't on my radar for sure, but that there would be a substantial number of students who didn't do that hot on a quiz and weren't also very interested in giving the effort to go back and um, make some corrections. And as I think about that now, very directly, um, my role as a teacher was very transactional from the standpoint of, you know, you hand this in, you have a, a great increase and in opportunity to earn some points back, and a lot less maybe focused on the, the meaning behind the why of correcting our mistakes and learning from our errors and finding those um, situations where the problem solving process broke down, et cetera. And again, that just um, really shows and distinguishes in a meaningful way from a classroom perspective, the growth versus fixed mindset. Now, uh, maybe not the most impressive looking um, graphic here, but Blackwell and colleagues have found that um, growth mindset generally increased performance um, 
reflective of more positive brain activity when making mistakes. In a earlier study, um, Blackwell was able to actually um, measure by categorizing students with fixed or growth mindsets, progress as it relates to class performance um, starting in seventh grade in the fall and ending at the end of their junior high year in eighth grade. And seeing again with the proper supports and fostering um, notions related to mindset that students again achieve better. They were more um, engaged and more receptive to things like feedback and, and adversity and their willingness to roll their sleeves up and to um, take active roles related to their learning. So when we think about the origin of fixed mindset, it's important to, to think about this in some ways that are practical for us as educators. First of all, um, we may have some folks watching that have experience with children, maybe even your own kids. I know that I have um, one son who actually fits into this age range, but praising um, babies and young children uh, 14 to 38 months has been shown to have a, a positive effect on mindsets later in life. Children who were praised were more likely to develop growth mindsets. Um, it's important also um, that what we say to children, and we can really translate this into you know, primary school children all up to high schoolers, this has a potential impact on mindset. And these are things that I would hope would be um, certainly fairly intuitive. But um, saying things like, he's a born loser, or she will never amount to anything, will absolutely contribute to a fixed mindset. Also, one thing that we want to be aware of is that Fixed praise, um, that that meaning, you know, boy, Johnny, you're really smart or you're you're very talented. While in the moment may feel good, this may over the long term promote a fixed mindset because of the student's interest in preserving that status or that badge, if you will, relative to to their views on or I'm sorry, your views related to them and their abilities. It would certainly be compromising to a fixed mindset person if he or she um, did something, let's say not performing well on an activity or an assessment that would potentially change your view of their intelligence or giftedness. So, um, it's important for us to establish that mindset really is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Students who think they are able to increase their abilities are generally able to, while students who think their ability is fixed are less likely to see a growth in their ability. There's a ceiling effect. It's asymptotic if you're uh, coming at this from a math background. And this is really because students with the growth mindset are more likely to put the effort into learning and take responsibility for learning. And that means beyond certainly doing their homework, being engaged in class, taking on opportunities to participate in ways that, again, are comfortable for them. That doesn't mean that every student who's not standing on the top of their desk waving their hand at every question you ask is a fixed mindset person, but rather again, according to his or her own um, social comforts and abilities to vocalize those types of things, that can be absolutely something that you see is more um, internalized as well, and also learning from their mistakes. We see that students with the growth mindset are much more willing to engage in significant practice for meaningful learning. They're willing to do something that, that we refer to as productive struggle. And um, it's important that, that this is something that we talk about because 
Um, in the math world specifically, when we talk about the mathematical practice standards or the standards for mathematical practice, um, productive struggle is absolutely central to this notion of stick to itness and and the idea that students are resilient in, in doing things like problem solving. Again, fixed mindset students allow or a fixed mindset allows students to throw in the towel if they believe they're not good enough to, to succeed. And that, again, is, is a behavior that I shared with our work with K-8 elementary school teachers, and that certainly is not limited to grade K-8 certification. It's certainly just the group we're working with right now. But this idea of when it gets hard, I quit. And, and we know, as students who have studied mathematics, um, who have studied any worthy discipline that, um, and I want to be very clear to say, you know, subject area wise, worthy discipline, worthy task. I'm not trying to, to sound like an elitist when I say this, but that any, any challenge, whether we're writing a paper in, in English, doing a presentation in social studies, you know, a particular science task or laboratory or inquiry activity, mathematics for sure, you name it that students, again, have the, the grit, if you will, and, and certainly the stick to itness to work through and productively struggle with some significant learning tasks or expectations. Now, specifically related to mathematics, and I've tried to provide really the initial parts of this presentation for um, everyone to have information to, to think about. Um, I will spend a few minutes here in math because a lot of our audience is is teaching math in some capacity or you're supporting uh, the teaching and learning of mathematics in your role. First of all, um, you know, this certainly would not be the case at Slip Rock University, but in all other places, um, it happens that folks, uh, um, folks who um, um, have studied mathematics at the college level. And you don't even have to get very deep into the waters here, um, but it, it turns out that, that mathematicians, uh, folks who um, have, let's say, PhDs in mathematics, can often be very fixed-minded about um, who can and can't learn their subject. Um, and I know this wouldn't apply to Slip Rock University, but there are absolutely um, experiences and stories that people would share where um, walking into a lecture hall, you get the impression, and it could be even explicitly stated by um, your college teacher of mathematics or professor that there are those who just are not positioned to do well in their class, and that is just a matter of fact. Um, that is not a very redeeming way to, in my opinion, kick off a class or to set a tone for growth and for learning in the room. And I would also say, in my experience as a secondary math teacher, that that level of arrogance can absolutely trickle down to high school teachers as well. And, um, and we see this a lot related to tracking, where students are, are, or teachers are in you know, these various tracks. And, and very quickly, um, in some cases, it's unfortunate, but it's true, kind of portray a tone that um, they're not entirely interested in working with average students or below average students. Um, we know something going back to IQs that about two thirds of our population has an IQ between 85 and 115, one standard deviation from the mean of 100 or average of 100. Two thirds of our students, again, are going to be average. That is just a matter of, 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 of looking and framing at the metric of intelligence quotient. 
but rather, again, trying to embrace this idea that we can grow and we can learn and we can get better is very important and something we want to be explicit talking to our students about. I mean, we see this all the time. I'm not good at math. I hate math. Or, you know, my brain is just not wired to do math well. And I would just caution you. Some of you may have had utterings of these last three different um, uh, statements. And I would tell you to be careful. These things um, have profound impact on your students. And it's okay, I think, on some level to be very reflective and also very honest to say that I have to work harder and it takes you know effort for me to learn mathematics. And I can tell you right now as someone who um, has learned some math in, in his day as well, that that is something that I'm very clear in conveying to my students. And this notion that we are not um, the source of all knowledge, that actually doing real mathematics is um, a tremendously time intensive process. And it's, it is challenging. Um, it also can be a lot of fun. But these are, again, things that are important for students to hear and to have the ability to interact with um, in a very safe and appropriate fashion uh, from you. So math is a subject, again, where effort and productive struggle are incredibly important. And this is, again, what makes fixed mindsets in math extremely harmful. So what can we do? Um, it's important, first of all, that students have some level or basic idea related to mindsets. Um, I don't think that it's any teacher's job or role uh, to label a student as being fixed or growth oriented, but certainly um, to make students aware of these, these different characteristics and to paint a portrait as to why um, cultivating a growth mindset is an important, vastly important component for performance and also success. Also, praising students for effort um, instead of, again, siloing students into intelligence categories or quartiles or however you want to look at this um, absolutely makes them more willing to roll their sleeves up and engage in meaningful learning. And that's not a hard thing to do, to meet students at their level and to observe their work product, which is going to absolutely be different for students at varying ability levels, but to acknowledge them for effort is a very significant step in the direction of supporting students' uh, growth and their mindset. A study um, suggests that um, they were able, as a result of having students take a 50-minute online course about mindsets, to move um, the median score by 0.1 GPA points and also reduce the number of students uh, receiving Ds or Fs by 5%. Now, um, certainly there could be some confounding variables into making those assertions, but please understand that the, the overall general findings of this particular study suggest that making students aware of mindsets um, and, and, and certainly giving valuable um, dialogue and time and effort into supporting students' awareness of how important their mindset is has tangible positive outcomes. Okay. Another thing that I just want to share, and certainly this is, um, you know, might as well have been my math class back in 2004, uh, actually hopefully not really, but in, in many cases, and um, I think that Elementary folks typically do a much better job at this than secondary folks. Um, teachers, in the spirit of really trying to um, take ownership of things like high stakes testing and covering topics and the standards, are 
<clears throat> often inclined to keep students in rows, to keep students seated at their desks, and to really <clears throat> not often enough pass the ball, meaning to engage students in this meaningful work that requires them uh, to do things like communicate and interact and revise. These again are valuable skills that promote growth and give this, the teacher an opportunity to get out from behind the desk, to get away from the front of the room and to interact with students in a meaningful way where things like feedback and really purposeful dialogue with students that allow them again to uh, hear encouragement, to receive needed support, uh, to allow you to differentiate activities um, as you see learning needs and misconceptions arise are extremely important. Now, when we talk about mathematics in particular, and we think about, again, changing the tide in mathematics, one thing that we have to really distinguish here is practicing basic math skills in learning math. Okay, I would argue uh, to the ends of the earth that doing math is not worksheet driven, drill and skill, or as you know, you've often heard drill and kill types exposure to computational mathematics. Now I point out NCTM here to say very directly, please do not misunderstand that I am being cavalier about students learning basic skills in mathematics. They absolutely must. This is not an either or. Both basic skills and procedural competency that's something that we talk about in um, you know, middle school and high school mathematics. Those are important things. Also, learning math by doing math is exceptionally important. And I have found in my career as a supervisor of, of, of teachers, as a, a high school principal, that certainly Again, I hope this doesn't come as a surprise, but certainly that teachers who struggle in the areas of student achievement are inclined to, again, assume the posture of learning by never passing the ball to their students. And it's important that as you look to frame your classroom, that students have meaningful opportunities that are evidenced through class time and cultivation to have exposure to significant learning experiences in mathematics. Again, it's important that we look at a positive attitude towards mistakes. It's, it's really profound for me, and I'll just digress here for one second, but that, but that uh, in teaching a middle school math methods class, and believe it or not, pre-pandemic, face-to-face. And in that class, um, every student in the course uh, had at least eight credit hours in calculus, at least, some of whom had an earned degree, a BS, in mathematics. And I'm talking about taking classes like in your linear algebra, differential equations, analysis, proof-based courses such as modern concepts, folks who have taken a lot of math. And in that class, starting every class period out with a, a problem from the NCTM website, figure this, figure this is the name of the website um, that came from a middle school classroom and watching folks who again had all of these high-powered mathematics classes on their transcript each and every class session struggle with a non-trivial problem. Folks who sat and worked and worked and worked and thankfully many of those students did show 
a, a tremendous amount of um, engagement in sticking with their, their particular problems that they were given. But please understand, very, in, very engaged in the learning process and very committed um, to, to, on some level, work through their mistakes, things they couldn't figure out, doing things like guessing and checking, making a table, things that those of us who teach math from a textbook and from very, very traditional means, meaning we model a problem, we have students show it to us, and we feel like all is well, never have the ability to grapple with significant learning experiences. And for that particular class I'm describing, again, math folks who are given middle school math problems Again, they're, they're not trivial. Um, they certainly don't have always direct solutions, etc. Watching them struggle and having them experience that, that things don't always neatly fit into a box, talking about mistakes, having the ability to dialogue with one another. Those are very powerful ways to foster growth and to support learning, to give feedback to discuss misconceptions through the lens of, again, mistakes and hardship. And that's a fantastic place to be in as we look to, again, fostering growth. Also, and this is really, really big, providing students with appropriately challenging problems. So we want to try to keep students um, certainly practicing the skills necessary that are important so we're not saying that drill or some level of, of exercise related to um, the problem solving process or in, in particular computations isn't important. It is, but it's also, while necessary, not sufficient to engaging students in productive struggle. In addition, providing appropriately challenging problems has been shown to increase student motivation. So we're talking about tasks here that are within reach for students. Okay, we don't foster growth and learning in our students by giving fifth graders uh, calculus two problems. Uh, that just isn't developmentally appropriate. So knowing your class, knowing your students, knowing where they're at and giving them again, learning experiences that allow them to stretch and to grow, to apply and, and, and really analyze are those, are those important and significant tasks that will be, again, growth-oriented. Again, making mistakes shows an increase of brain activity. As Joe Bowler says, and I love this, every time a student makes a mistake, they grow a synapse. And that's just not her position on things or, or some cute little phrase, but rather through brain science, that is something that her research has, you know, unpacked or, un or revealed. So please, again, make sure that mistakes are not trivialized. They're not sidelined. They're not dismissed. That we're not looking at, at all mistakes as being just computational errors or a lack of being um, careful or precise to detail, but rather many mistakes and again, this is a presentation in and of itself, but many mistakes, again, uh, provide fertile ground for discussing important underlying misconceptions that can give the teacher a tremendous amount of, of knowledge related to how students are thinking and also provide a beautiful conversation tool to get students more engaged in their, their learning through their own work in analyzing the work of their peers. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a pleasure to have the ability to share a bit about mindsets and specifically mathematical mindsets with you. Certainly, um, I would have enjoyed uh, having the chance to dialogue and to engage you personally uh, related to this topic. It's something that I'm very passionate about. Please understand that um, coming at mindsets and really being growth oriented um, is an investment worth making. Um, in a standards-based environment of high stakes testing, 
please understand that so often we are inclined um, as human beings to take the ball as the source of knowledge and to really make learning and specifically learning mathematics a top-down experience. Please do not repress learning to that level, but instead work hard to incorporate meaningful mathematical tasks for your students that engage them, that allow them to communicate, that allow them to dialogue, and that allow them to see and experience the richness of mathematics, the alternative methods of um, getting to significant tasks and um, alternative solution methods, but ultimately empowering them and building their toolbox to be more resourceful and, and more um, resilient students of mathematics and students really in general um, as they continue on with their education. Everyone, I hope you have a tremendous balance of your summer. And again, thank you so much for the time that you've taken to listen to this presentation. Goodbye.